So hear what I say, for it is the truth you see. There can only be one, the original. OG, two letters that define respect. Welcome to the first episode of the original OGs. I created the original OGs to document the forgotten parts of American history. I want to recognize and give a voice to the men and women that have climbed to the top of their game. Believe me, the men and women that sit in front of this marquee have been authenticated as original OGs. My name is Mr. Rick. Welcome to my world, a world of the originals, the unique. Welcome to the original OGs. Welcome to the Original OGs podcast, and I'm your host, Mr. Rick, interviewing real OGs for a real OG situation. Today we have a guest by the way of Atlanta. His name is Mr. Ken. How are you, sir? How you doing, sir? I am fantastic. We have a lot to cover here today, and we want to see if we can make sense of what's going on in our community and in this country. I want to start by asking you, where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Initially, I was raised in the Robert Taylor Projects, 4759 South Federal. Then we uh, eventually moved out to the Miners, 103rd and Jeffrey. Things was getting getting kind of difficult. My father got into it with the Black Panthers. They had beat him extremely bad, and my mother said it was time to go. So we ended up going to Milwaukee. You know, that's where I pretty much learned a lot of the things that I know in life. And uh, that's basically it, you know, and from Milwaukee, I went to school, you know. Why did they attack your father? Well, my father was a crooked dice shooter. And what he would do, he would shoot bad dice and he got caught. And they just so happened to uh, do it on some Black Panthers. And uh, I was telling Chairman Fred Hampton about this. Uh, we were talking. When he was in at my facility in the, in Atlanta, I was explaining to him. I said, "You know, it's ironic that you're Black Panther. And <laughs> you're coming to speak to my to my hip hop fraternity organization, and your uh, you know your people beat my father up." So that stemmed from we could say a street situation. Yeah, yeah. Pops was he was street. So let me ask you this: What do you see the difference in? viewing that picture of your father in that time, the difference between that and today? Well, ironically speaking, you know, my father was my hero. Of course, I I assume those who were fortunate enough to grow up with a father, you know, the father is generally the first teacher, you know, he teaches you everything. And uh, when I look at it in that era of time, I mean, that was like severe. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you know, if somebody do what my father did today, they would probably be murdered. So I think the time from then into now is that most of our people back then were pretty much coming from the South. You know, I, I call it the Great Migration. Mm-hmm. And in that era of time, you know, they still had Southern ways, and you know, it wasn't as violent as it was uh, up here mm-hmm. up north. So you know, the difference was. You know, I think that they were at that point, it was still for family. It was still, you know, our people still communicate with each other. We still have family outings and barbecues and stuff like that. Now I think all that has been just devoided. And right now we, we're on a, a rampage, mm-hmm. you know, as, as a community. Where is your family originally from? Uh, Oxford, Mississippi. Oxford, Mississippi. What type of climate was that? Yes, um, my grandfather was a, I mean, he, he was a sharecropper. And for a lot of people to understand is that at one time, you know, uh, after slavery, they had what you call uh, like different contracts with the ex-slave masters. To rent the land. No, it was pretty much like a contract, you know, instead of you just leaving the plantation, mm-hmm. you would have to work and you could work for land you could work for whatever. Okay. It was a contract that okay. you and uh, the uh, the sharecropper or the person that owned the farm would uh, agree to. So my grandfather, he worked for this gentleman and uh, 
he was able to procure 160 acres of okay. land, which that land is still in the Ivy uh, Dynasty right now. So my point. grandfather was a very strict man. He was very abusive towards my father. He would beat him profusely if he or him and or the 18 kids my grandmama had. Wow. So they grew up in a big family, and I was fortunate enough, you know, being from Chicago to go down there every summer. And, you know, they had pigs and chickens, and it was a real farm. We had horses. You know, we had a lot of land. We had our own pine back there, so wow. we basically grew our own food and stuff like that. And my grandfather was very business-minded. So that had translated to my father. So even though my father was in the streets, he still owned clubs and, mm -hmm. and bars and you know he was a businessman and that may explain why you know I became a businessman because it was kind of like genetically. Well I mean that happened with me I wanted to go into business because of a few people in my family that I saw who had went in that direction and I saw the benefit of it. Absolutely. You know? So what caused your grandparents or your parents to move north? Well, uh, one of my uncles had, uh, Uncle Earl came up here. He got a job at General Motors. And another one of my uncles came to, my uncle David went to Milwaukee and got a job at A.O. Smith, which is like a factory type job. Mm -hmm. And so the word spread it throughout the South that, you know, the opportunity was up north. So all right. of them migrated up north to get jobs. But I don't know if you know much about the South, but in the South, uh, a lot of, of the guys, you know, the con men and the hustlers would go through there and they would hustle. And a lot of times in order to hustle, they had to befriend a country dude. So they would befriend people like my uncle and my father and they would hustle with them and they taught them to hustle. So when they came to the city, mm -hmm. they already had the game. So they had to hustle. So he would, that, along with a job opportunity and the hustle, they would come up here and they would hustle these guys because, you know, a lot of people think that people in Chicago or the city people were city slickers, but they were actually, in country so many people. cases, country dumb, yeah. you yeah. know. And so a lot, a lot of country people would come up here and swindle the city guys, ironically speaking. So, you know, that's what my father now did. It was an opportunity to, to hustle the city slickers and play the country boy role and they was able to get up on them and play them a little slicker, a little faster, you know. So that was one of the primary things that they did. And then, you know, my mother, she uh, worked in the factories. And then a lot of my cousins and uncles, you know, they worked in the factories. And that was one of the reasons why they came up here. Where I eventually moved to Milwaukee, we had a lot of OG females, you know, that gamble, that sold drugs, you know, that ran businesses and stuff like that. And we would call them... OGs, you know, like she our OG, yeah, you know, because she was a hustler, you know, and, and my definition of OG is a person who goes, you know, we call it like even in, in certain things you say, oh, he's, he, he's, he used to be a P. Mm -hmm. Oh, he ain't a P no more. He's a Mac. Mm -hmm. So you go from P and a Mac. And so once you get into that Mac status, it's all about, you know, open up businesses. You know, it's about, you know, telling the kids to stay out of, out of trouble, go to school. Mm -hmm. You know, you go from being an OOO, an operation officer of nothing, to a CEO, you know, a chief operation officer. Yes. You know, you become a, you know, you become an executive exactly. in the streets, and that's what makes you an OG. You can make executive or what they say OG calls. So to me, a uh, OG is an executive, a person who has, who has pretty much pivoted into another level of understanding. Exactly. You know, another level of conducting business. You know, because OG. Nine times out of ten is the one that usually stopped the murder in the hood because right. he have that experience of being in and out of jail. He have that experience or she have that experience of being in and out of trouble. They didn't sold drugs. They didn't did everything. So now, you know, they're OG. You know, they could just be, an uh, OG could be like, I got guys in my community in, in particular who are businessmen who never been to jail, who never participated in crime, but they... Our OGs because they say, OG, how did how did you do it? Well, get you some real estate. OG, how did you do it? You know, you get you uh, 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 some some property. You do this, you do that, and they OGs too. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, then you know you got a lot of OGs, female OGs in the hood. You know, somebody said, well, how do you do it? Oh, get you a beauty a beauty a supply store. Get you a restaurant. Get you and these with the OGs ladies Take charge. Yeah, that's what these old ladies was doing. They was running businesses. Yeah. On this show. 
the term OG is a term of endearment. Endearment. You absolutely. see what I'm saying? So it's transparent. Transparent. You know, you right. can anyone can wear it. Mm -hmm. It's not because of your age. Mm -hmm. It's because you have come through your journey and gotten into a place that you were comfortable comfortable with and taken control of it. Absolutely. And then you began to benefit or to cause the benefit for other people. Right. That that's how we look at it on this show. So right. it could be male, female, it could be white, black, Chinese, Martian. As long as you fit the criteria, it's not necessarily because you live to be a certain age, because we know some people just don't get it. So, we well, don't. you know, I, I got people in my life who will say, "Hey, I'm 50 years old," and I tell them, "I said no, I said you're 30. You just <laughs> repeated it 20 more times." I said, "Because if you you're, you're a fool, and if you had a bigger head, you'd be a bigger a fool." A bigger fool. So, you know, age definitely doesn't make you wise. I didn't met young people, you know, like my man Montana, you know, he's a young dude, but I always tell him, I say, you got an old soul. Yes. You know, you got an old soul. And, you know, we got young people, if they're mild mannered and they're not to conduct themselves, they can be OGs. Exactly. You know, we got people, you know, like you said, it's, a, it's an endearment. It's really, in so many, so many ways, to me, it seemed like a person who have graduated. You know what I mean? They graduate, they got a PhD. It could be a player in hustler's degree, you know? And they just got a degree in hustling. They got a degree in, in common sense. You know, because exactly. sense ain't really that common. That's what my grandmother said. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people, you know, even though they, uh, uh, you know, they, you know, I mean, it's like, and then, you know, a, a prime example, uh, Muhammad, Ali, Muhammad Ali used the analogy. He said, if you're doing the same thing at 40 that you did at 20, then you lost 20 years. You, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so if you are OG, you know, you learn from your experiences. You exactly. Know? And, and, and life is, is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Exactly. So you, learn, you learn as you go. You know, as you go down the road of life and you, 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 know, you get a, a, a milestone in the journey of the race, you gain a milestone. So I think that that's what life is all about. You know, had, you know, had I not went through what I went through, <laughs> I would not be an OG. You, you know, be the person. Man, you, you was are. talking uh, on the phone, and I was telling you. I said, Rick, you know, you only get one time when we did that movie. I said, you only get one time to be that guy. Exactly. After that, you know, the thrill is gone. <laughs> like BB King said, the thrill is gone. So, ain't nobody expecting you to be great again. You know, you was great once. You know, okay. you did you did one great act, and then they're gonna judge you from that. You know what I mean? So, in life, you know, as an OG. You want to pretty much look at life as the first part of your life is a legacy. You know, you, you're building legacy. Mm -hmm. And the second part is dynasty. Right. Where you create generational wealth. You, you give that knowledge and wisdom and understanding. You pass that on to your children. I agree. And, you know, you, you create a situation where your children can be financially well off. Well, well off. Let's expound upon that children. Mm -hmm. uh, how many children do you have? <laughs> Man, don't give me a lie. I don't care. I'm probably, I don't know how many I got, but I know I, I can count. I, I can think of them. I, I, I just say I got two boys that I know for sure. Mm -hmm. I got maybe six girls. And you have children that are doing some pretty exceptional things. Well, like I say, the chip don't fall too far from the stone. Mm -hmm. Wherever you see an apple, you're going to see an apple tree somewhere. Somewhere. So genetically, you know, I'm in the entertainment business so my children was raised in, up in entertainment. All the celebrities used to come by my house, you know. Uh, cool. You know, I, I don't want to name nobody because mm -hmm. there's too many of them, but all of them would come by and my children would see that. And because of that, you know, I was able to send my, my sons had an appetite or aspiration to be in the entertainment business. So I sent one to California to film school, New York Film Academy. He's now on that show called... Uh, all American, mm -hmm. you know, the, the little guy, the, the quarterback number 14, that's my son. His name is Ken Ivey. They go back to the dynasty. Mm -hmm. You know, he's also doing the show with Angela Bassett and uh, Will Smith. He's working on that new Will Smith movie called uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, where they actually go back to the part where he was actually before he was Fresh Prince. So, yeah, little Kenny is doing well. Then my other son, I sent him to college in Atlanta. He's uh, into engineering and uh, music and stuff like that. So, yeah, I was in entertainment, you know. Mm -hmm. I was on 40 million records. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't been on albums with uh 
uh, 50 Cent, Nelly, Too Short, Jermaine Dupri, Pimp C, Pastor Troy, Mac 10, over 40 million, Ice T, Big Daddy Kane. So mm-hmm. my kids seen that growing up, and they and I gave them books like Think and Grow Rich. I gave them the 48 Laws of Power. You know, when they when I disciplined my kids, I didn't discipline them with a belt. I made them write words down. I would write 10 words from the dictionary, big words, and they would have to write them words hundreds and hundreds of times. You know, I grew up in the hood, and like I said, Robert Taylor home. So when I got me a little money, Rick, it was around by when I was about 30, I, I did pretty well for myself. I, I moved out into the suburbs mm-hmm. in Milwaukee, Menominee Falls. And like I said, I used to do a lot of party. I had a mansion, so all the celebrities would come. And, you know, so I, I kind of gave them that life that I didn't have. Right. You know, I showed them success. My entire, I never smoke around them, drink around them. That's very important. You can't do nothing, no negativity around your kids. I never did anything negative that would give them the impression that it was cool. So my sons didn't, they didn't, they didn't think about being in the game. They didn't think about selling drugs. You know, I mean, they, they had the best of everything. I, I put a basketball court, you know, I put a swimming pool in my yard so they can always, you know, have things that other kids desire, you know, and go out and do negative things for it. And they didn't have to go off the, off the, off off the, the trail, bed. you know yes, what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that was one of the things I did, and I kept books around them, like books on, you know, uh, Dr. Ben, you know, uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar, you know, uh, uh, Napoleon Hill just kept all positivity around them. You exactly. know, I was I never missed their their events, their school. I always went to their school. You know, when I was away traveling, I would always call them and talk to them. And one of my sons, I used to always grab him and I used to rub our nose together. I said, "Love that, that, love that, that." I was psychologically teaching them about love. You know, and you know that's just one of the things that I wanted to do. And then you know when they got old enough. You know, the decisions they made was based on their, their upbringing, which was pretty much positivity. So they made a lot of positive moves. How did you escape the violence? Uh, the violence? The violence of our community, because it had, you know, at one time, it, it's, it ain't good now. Well, you know, I, 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 I didn't really escape it. You know, I was kind of like, I was a bad kid. You know? Okay. And I didn't have to be a bad kid. But uh, how I was able to overcome the violence and how I was overcome my situation was, you know, I eventually, you know, started educating myself. I started reading a lot Mm -hmm. and I started picking mentors. And the mentors I picked was out of the magazines, you know, like Don Keene. I would take a picture of Don Keene and put it on my wall. Uh, Reginald Smith, you know. I I know this dude was fictitious, but I like the JR from JR Ewing. <laughs> right. I would put JR, I would put all these people and I would just imagine myself doing business like them. Right. You know, I would imagine myself being smart like Don King. And, and you know, if you look at my life, Rick, it kind of mimics Don King. Don King knew all the celebrities mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, he was able to throw parties and, you know, do big things and we did that. You know, you've been to a couple of my parties. So oh, yes, you know, sir. you got to surround yourself with positivity, positive mentors, you know. Otherwise, see your mind, let me tell you something. Your mind doesn't know the difference between negative or positive. Your mind is like a depository. It it takes in everything. Either it or. takes in everything. So everything that we see, these cameras, all this stuff, your suit, our suits, our mind is simultaneously picking these things up. True. So what we have to do, we got to program our mind through repetition, through subliminal suggestions to think a certain way. True. And that's what I did. Once I changed my thinking, once I was able to change my attitude, I was able to change my situation. You know exactly. what I'm saying? You know, once I was able to change my mentality, I was able to change my reality. So if you want to change your aptitude, you got to change your attitude, you got to change your aptitude. And that's when I just everything just started coming together. And I, you know, I would read the Wall Street Journal. I would read, you know, Business Weekly. I just changed the stuff that I was doing exactly. and I was able to overcome. This show has the intent to define what a real OG is, what an original OG is. My partner and I have developed a method to ensure that if someone should sit in front of this OG logo, that they have been authenticated and found to be true in their history as far as what an OG is. So when you were being, or when you were coming up in our community, seeing the things that you saw, did you ever think that the government was having a hand at that? 
Oh, most definitely. I mean, everything that we see in our community is definitely uh, a result of social engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, we don't own no planes. We don't own no trains. We don't own nothing, but we got massive drugs in our community. You know, we don't manufacture a gun. Half of us don't even know how to take a gun apart, but yet... We, we own you know, thousands we own, of them. We own thousands of them, and that is not by accident. That is definitely by design. Now, when I think of the United States government, you know, I think of, you know, they say, well, how can the government do something to a community? Well, they send smallpox into the Indian in Tuskegee Institute. You know what I'm saying? They uh, shot them people up with uh, syphilis. You know what I'm saying? So even though, then you look at Quintel Pro. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, his biggest thing was a black messiah. He said, I do, he said we do not want Prevent a black messiah. Him. Prevent a black messiah. Kill all black kids that may become radical. And that it was it was, it was basically was fear. You know, the, the America problem with with with, with uh, attacking the African American community is that I think it's it's primary fear, and it's not all white people. You know, it's it's a it's a specific set of people who are who are paid and who are part of a system that keeps systemic racism going. You know what I'm saying? You you know, it's a system. And then, you know, you got, when you look at the criminal justice system, Rick, mm -hmm. it's 2.5 million people incarcerated, right? 50% mm -hmm. of them are African Americans. Mm -hmm. But African Americans only make up 13% of the population, and only 6% of them are eligible to go to prison. America is 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarceration, and 50% in of all the incarceration is of African American descent. Now think about that. Yeah, that's something to think about. That's and it leads me to a question to ask. How do you think there are some ways that we can combat that? How do we ameliorate that? The best way to combat that is through shows like this, the OG show. My man. See, the reason why these kids act the way they act is because when America put, you know, when, when the CIA or somebody put a counterinsurgency drug out there like heroin and cocaine and we, it's, that's what it does. It, it, it keeps you from having an insurgent, uh, insurrection. They don't want you to, you know, they don't want you to erupt. So they, they put drugs in your community and they allow the drugs to come in your community. So therefore, the drugs is pervasive. pervasive. So mm -hmm. how you do that, how you attack that is you, you have more positive images like ourselves, people who came from the mud, you know, and got it from the blood. You know, we got to transform. We have to, exactly. all the OGs, we have to come and, and we got to change our mindset. You exactly. know, we got to start thinking like eagles and not like chickens. I ain't got nothing against a chicken. I ate one five minutes ago. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But we got to start thinking like an eagle. And what an <laughs> eagle does is an eagle spreads his wings exactly. nine feet and it soars through the air. Not only do an eagle soar through the air, when an eagle sees a storm, it goes into the storm and it shoots up in the storm and it flies above the storm. You know, when the eagle makes love, it don't make love on the ground. It makes love in the air and it spins while it's making love. That's why you never see a chicken making love with an eagle because it only can jump five <laughs> feet. Can't get you see there. what I'm saying? You only can go five feet. So exactly. then, when the, and then another thing, when the eagle see another bird, a pigeon, you know what he do? He fly up because he know he flying too low. Mm -hmm. So we got to start thinking like eagles. You know what I'm saying? I ain't, I ain't talking about let your eagle be your worst no, amigo. I, I get, I see, get what I'm you're saying. saying. If you ain't humble, you'll come. But some of us let our eagle be our worst amigo. But I'm talking about an eagle. That's the reason why the eagle is the American bird because the eagle is so profound. You know. But I think the biggest mistakes that eagle make, and I told you this the other day, is that when an eagle see a weasel, it goes down on the weasel and it gets the weasel. And then what the weasel does is the, the weasel eats into the eagle's chest. And so as the eagle ascend, you start <laughs> seeing them begin to descend because the eagle that ate his heart, I mean the weasel that ate his heart out. So we as OGs, not only we got to be eagles, but we can't be messing with weasels neither. Exactly. You know, we got to let these negative things go. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. You, know, you just got to let go. Just like, take a breath. If you don't let it go, what you gonna do? You gonna die. You, you know yourself. what I'm saying? I mean, so some things you gotta let go. You know, and, and that's what we got to do as OGs. We have to just let all that negative ne negativity go and accept that, like the fat lady says, it's over. You know, once the fat lady sings, <laughs> yeah, it's that's over. over with. It's over. I mean, ain't no more. I mean, the, the funny hats and the guy with the with the stacks and all the hills. <laughs> he's gone home. The party's over with. Party is over, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they need they need more Mr. Ricks and and, and Kens and and Virgil and, and Fashion. You know, brothers who have made transform, have sang way into another life. This is not limited to us. No. We want people to join this movement. This is a movement. We're, we're in a very peculiar situation and we have to accept that. 
you know, when, when you get in the boxing ring and you're trying to win that title, mm -hmm. then you need tools. Mm -hmm. you, you need to have already sharpened Skills. your tools. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't get in there saying, well, you know, today I'm going to be a great fighter. It doesn't work that way. You have to prepare to be a great fighter. We, we, we've taken a pretty good journey here, brother. You know, uh, we've recognized a few of the problems, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I know you. Mm -hmm. You know, I know what you're about. How about if we take the journey to know some of the solutions right. to this problem? I know you have a solution. Right. Let, let's, let's expound on that. The first thing that I would like to say is that one of the solutions that I came up with was that most of our young people like hip hop, hip hip hop. You know, I thought about it, you know, the Nation of Islam is a great organization. The Potter House, T.D. Jakes is a great organization. Action Network with uh, my man Al Sharpton is a great, uh, you know, the NAACP. Mm -hmm. All of so these, is, these is nice organizations. But what, what channel our young people today is hip hop. Thinking about it, I was perusing the, uh, the, the Google, I was Googling names, and I was looking at all the available names on Google and GoDaddy, and the words, the names that I came up was hip hop fraternity, because hip hop is very prevalent in our community, and the word fraternity is very prevalent in our community. So, you know, a lot of people, they think of the Masons, they think of the Q Dogs, the, you know, mm -hmm. the Greeks, and so on and so forth. You think of hip hop, you think of the genre of the music industry, you know, and it's so popular and it's the number one genre. They're selling billions of records. So when I came up with the Hip Hop Fraternity, which is my organization, you know, uh, I started about nine months ago in my condo in Buckhead. And uh, uh, after about two or three weeks, we've seen about 40, 50 people. Mm -hmm. Presently, we had about 3,000 people. I met Beautiful six thing. chapters. We got a chapter in Chicago. We got one in uh, Minnesota. We got a brother of Montana in Dallas. We got a brother Stacy out there in uh, in Denver. We got a uh, brother uh, 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 Righteous in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So you know we have chapters Expanded. all over, and mm -hmm. uh, so our main uh, purpose and main core is love, peace, and respect. So the purpose of the hip hop fraternity, how you deal with the solutions is you give the people, you give the young people something that they are privy to, something that they love, something that they can identify with, you know, and that's hip hop. So exactly. we bring them together and what I do is I allow myself to uh, be available. You know, I put my resources up, my finances, and so I pay for the whole thing myself. And mm -hmm. so I have a facility called the Hip Hop Attorney Headquarters, it's 51,000 square feet. We got four studios that's in there. That's pretty big. Yeah, 51,000 square feet. The biggest this place we at. Yeah, it's twice as big. big. So we, we, we allow them, we got four studios so they can come there and they can uh, get their music on. We allow them to perform. I feed them every Monday and we have meetings and they, the, 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 on, the only caveat is that they have to listen to our speakers. So we have speakers come in and we teach them about cryptology, we teach them about uh, blockchain, we teach them about ASCAP, BMI. Uh, That's pretty we teach advanced about, stuff about, there. Yeah, NFC technology, because the music industry has advanced. And so a lot of these young people, you know, they won't listen to the, 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 the mosque. They won't listen to Islam. They won't listen to Christianity, but they will listen to anything got to do with the music business. That's their lane. Yeah, that's their lane. You know, like we grew up, some of us grew up in the church, some of us grew up in the mosque. That was fashionable to us back in the day. Well, hip hop is fashionable to them. This is the fed. This is what they're doing right now. So we built this organization, and through this organization, I, I've been able to put all the producers, the A and Rs. Uh, Ice T is a member of my organization, and, and for those of you who don't believe, you go to thehiphopfraternity.com. You see Ice, Ice T. He did a commercial for us. Uh, uh, Rick Ross, uh, uh, Slap, uh, 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 Maybach Music is an organization, part of the organization. We got uh, my man Bootsy, we got Goody Mob. I got all the celebrities that's a part of this organization. So it's growing pretty quick. And that's one of the solutions is to teach these people how to become businessmen, how to become more financially literate. A lot of times we talk about Black Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm. But what people don't realize is that hip hop is Black Wall Street. Hip hop have produced more billionaires. You have one person, Kanye West, worth six billion, worth more than the entire GDP of, <laughs> of, 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 of Tulsa, Oklahoma at that time. 
Exactly. You know, but the reason why they tell you to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because, you know, unfortunately, those people, 300 of those people were killed. They tell you about Martin Luther King. They put a street on every block, but unfortunately, Martin Luther King was killed. We got people like Percy Julian. You know, nobody never talk about Charles Drew, you know, ben Benjamin Banneker. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, just all of these great African-American, Mansa Musa, Sunni Ali, all these great people of our history, but we never talk about it. We talk about Martin Luther King, we talk about Black Wall Street, but I'm trying to tell people is that hip hop is Black Wall Street. Hip hop produced most of your billionaires. You hip hop know. is the modern day train for young people. Yeah, and the internet, you know, exactly. which is the fourth industrial revolution. And, I, and that's what we teach our children also. We teach them, hey man, listen, you want to get on the fourth, fourth industrial revolution. You, you missed all the other ramps. You don't want to get off. You don't want to miss this ramp. Hello. You want to get off here. And, you know, it, what internet does is it, lay in, it levels the playing field. And, you know, I mean, even look at, we was talking about streaming. Look at the streaming business, you know. Uh, uh, create creators, you know, that's what we call them in in, in, in my industry. We call uh, hip, uh, uh, artists, we don't call them artists anymore, we call them creators because they are uh, content creators. Exactly. They create content. This is what we're doing now. This is content. This is content creation. And, and this is where the future is going. You know, we didn't get in the railroad revolution. We didn't get in the, the auto industrial revolution. We missed all those revolutions, but we as a people, African we American, we don't have no excuses now. Here we you know, are. Once again. the internet was created and we was able to go to create, the, the, the playing field has been leveled now. You know, and, and like I said, you know, we teach all of our children these things. And another thing we teach them, we teach them about financial literacy. You know, I tell them, I'll, I tell them all the time, I say, if, I, if I produce a song in the studio and I took a $100 bill and I gave it to you, I said, here, Mr. Rick, here's a $100 bill, you would say, hmm, I'm a Universal Records, I'm going to give you 15 cent royalties on this $100 bill. This 100% of your IP, your intellectual property, but yet, you know what I'm saying, I mean, you know, you sell a million records, or if you do a million dollars, at 15%, you're going to get 150000 The record label get 850000 But if I say, Rick, here's $1,000 for this Rolls Royce, you're going to say, he must think I'm crazy. <laughs> but if you, if you look at it mathematically, you're talking about the difference of 449000 versus 850000 so if you're giving your intellectual property, you might as well just get a Rolls Royce away too. So we're teaching them about autonomy and independence. That's very, very important, you know, intellectual property. Um, that's one of the things that children really, really need to explore. Absolutely. You know, because that's where they rip you blind. You know, my partner and I, we had some battles with that issue. You know, the first thing we did was to protect our IP. Mm -hmm. You know, and then someone tried to come along and maneuver around that and we dealt with it and it ended up in a good space because we were aware. Can I say something? Sure. You know, I've been on a lot of records, right? Yes, sir. So naturally, I get publishing, right? Yes, sir. Did you know that publishing 89 years after you dead is still relevant? Yes, sir. I'll give you an example of publishing how important intellectual property is. Uh, Dolly Parton, you know who that is? Yes, I do. I Would Always Love You. She did a song <laughs> called I Would Always Love You, right? Yes. You remember The Bodyguard? The movie yes. The Bodyguard? Well, you know, Whitney Houston redid that song. Mm -hmm. Who you think got the money? Whitney Houston, Dolly Parton. It was Dolly's song. Dolly Parton got the song. Every time somebody played it at a wedding, Dolly Parton get money. Uh, the guy, uh, Sir Miss a lot. Yeah. You know, he did a song called Big Butts. That song makes more money. He makes more money off of publishing on that song than some artists make currently off their publishing. Exactly. You know, and publishing is a big thing. Intellectual property is a big thing. And Congress even set laws in order for us to be able to, to extract, to extrapolate that publishing, uh, the, uh, the, the rewards of that publishing. But what happens is, you know, a lot of us don't understand business. We go into these, these uh, different situations and we understand Blindly. the breakdown. I mean, it's like Ray Charles leaving Stevie Wonder. You know, you don't know what's going on, but it's a blind leading the blind type of thing. And then, you know, even these young people who sign with Jay-Z or they sign with Yo Gotti. If you sign with Yo Gotti and, and he signed to Jay-Z and he signed to Universal, you're not independent. You know, you're, you're losing, you, your money is, is sliced. Like, and, and, and when, I, when, I, when I was going, I was doing the research, I, was doing, I hired a, a forensic accountant to do the due diligence on how much money was owed to me. Uh, I found out, and a lot of people don't understand it, going back to intellectual property, that it's a thing called copyright control. 
Thank you. And in copyright control, that's where all the money is. Thank you. You know, Michael Michael Jackson, he owned the Beatles uh, publishing, but they wasn't tripping on the publishing. Everybody was wondering, how is Michael Jackson staying in these uh, houses and renting them for $100,000 a month? <laughs> because the royalties, I mean, Thank the interest you. that he was getting on the publishing was astronomical. You Took know, care of his whole publishing, is, publishing is everything. Every artist that wakes up, the first thing they do is they buy their publishing. Yeah, we, we, we need to expound on that more because that, that's very important. It's very beautiful that you're doing that. You know, uh, my partner and I, our goal is to do parallel mm -hmm. things of that nature. See, what you're saying and what you're doing in Atlanta here we want to create or we have created a platform for you to be able to expound upon the things that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. When these children learn everything that you've taught them, they go out and create, we have a platform for them to launch. That's very important because we're study running around begging. Uh, can you put me and that's when you are you at your you're most vulnerable because people are going to take advantage of you. Well, you know, the, the first time I did a major deal, I got uh, a quarter million dollars from Simon & Schuster. And uh, that was to write my book, The 48 Laws of Game. And uh, so two years, three years go by. Where's my royalties? <laughs> uh, you ain't earned them yet. Six years, where's my royalty? You ain't earned them yet. <laughs> and so I asked to look at the contract, and there was a word in the contract said, after the first part would be 15%, that's for the hardcover. After that, they revert to 5% when they revert to uh, a paperback. I, the one word revert was the difference of me receiving millions and millions of dollars because right now I think that book they did in excess of $6 million. It's sold all over the world. So it's a very successful book. I see why they gave me a quarter million dollars now. <laughs> but, you know, I was able to procure my uh my rights i end up getting the rights for my audio book which you know at the time i got it was about six years ago i understood that you know it was mega trends that society was turning towards something else you know it was turning towards you know streaming and exactly. you know downloads and stuff like that so i was able to get that deal back and you know sometimes we make mistakes and we like learn. you said you know they tried to take you and your partner's uh intellectual property but as we learn we make uh, positive statement. That's what this OG thing is about. That's exactly what it's about. Hey, man, we could go on and on and on, but, you know, somewhere we got to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, this happens to be that time. We're going to have to have you come back on the show at a later date so we can pick up where we left off. Right. You know, this is the original OGs. This has been my friend for a long time. You know, uh, we've been out here. We've made our mistakes. Uh, we're in a space now to where we're trying to do things to create a positive example in a positive space. And that's what we're going to keep doing. Uh, stay tuned. We have other guys coming. We're going to always keep bringing the heat. So just subscribe. Stay tuned. Uh, you're going to be surprised where this thing is going. Again, my friend, it's been my pleasure. We have created this show so that men and women alike can come forward and tell their truth. If you have people that you believe to be an OG, go into the comment section, write us, let us know where to find the history so that we can authenticate it, bring them on the show, tell their story so that we can add to the American history. That's it. That's all. The original OG.